By the way, guys, I'll just use this microphone. I think that's going to be easier. All right, one of the first things I wanted to do with you all, and this may work, it may not, but I'd like you all to stand up, please. I guess we've all been sitting down for quite a while. One thing I'm really big on is energy, so I want you just to shake, shake yourselves a little bit. Let's be Taylor Swift for a moment. The next thing I want you to do is turn to the person to your left and massage their shoulders. <laughs> only the shoulders, only the shoulders. Okay, now switch, turn the other direction, massage again. All right, that should just about do us. <laughs> so aside from that just being a really fun thing to do, it teaches us about connection. I mean, connectedness, I think, is what makes us human. And it's definitely what makes cities human. And I think we forget that a lot. One thing I really love in this country is you hug everybody. In Australia and the UK, where I'm from, we, uh, we handshake. Occasionally we kiss the cheek of a, of a, of a lady. Uh, but here I love it that we actually get to hug. So when you hug, I don't know whether you know this or not, but if you give 10 hugs a day, you generate enough oxytocin within your body to actually make you happier and the people around you happier and actually live longer. So hugging is really, really, really important. Now the second thing that's really important to me is what, what's called work-life integration. So a lot of people talk about work-life balance. I like to talk about work-life integration. So. How I achieve work-life integration is I bring my family as much as I can into the work that I do. So what I'd really love for you all to do, if you'd bear with me, I'm going to get my video going. I'd love for you all, please, because I've had to come here and, and leave my two kids, uh, Jack, who's 12, and Emily, that's 11. So what I tend to do whenever I speak is I actually ask the audience if they'd say hello to Jack and Emily, if that's cool. All right, so. So when I say, I'm going to go three, two, one, and if you could all say, hi, Jack and Emily. That would be great. Okay. Three, two, one. Hi, Fantastic. Thank you. Perfect. That gets me daddy points. <laughs> we just had the daddy-daughter dance at the, at the school, and it was an 80s theme, and I let my, uh, I let my daughter decide what I would wear. So I ended up going in a rainbow tutu, skin tight black jeans, Doc Martin boots. She put eye makeup on me and a rainbow colored Mohican, which was, which was really cool. So you can probably tell from my accent I'm not from America. I spent 22 years of my life in England and, 22 year, and 20 years of my life in, uh, in Australia. One of the things that you were showing earlier, which just jogged my memory, I love the fact that you've got the downtown guide people and people walking around helping people. Where I'm from, in Manchester, we have a bit of a sense of humor. And uh, when we had the Commonwealth Games there, the city thought it'd be really fun to get these really beautiful women in scantily dressed clothing with a big sign on their, on their breasts saying, misinformation. <laughs> and what they did was they walked around the city and people would ask them for advice and they would give them the opposite of the advice, just, just, for, just for fun. And a German tourist actually wrote a letter of complaint to the city, which they put on the front page of the newspaper. And the first sentence of it, I am writing to complain that misinformation gave me the wrong information. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if anyone would like to ask me any question, please tweet me. It's uh, Marco Rolo, so M-A-R-K-O-R-O-W-O. -O -O. I respond to every tweet. Uh, also, if you have any questions, you can email me as well. It's mark at rocketeer.com. Um, also, if you'd like a copy of this presentation, please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to send a copy to you. Oops. Not this one. Sorry. Can't seem to change a slide. Bear with me. There you go. All right, so we're going to start talking about Zappos. Now, I don't actually work for Zappos. Um, Tony, Tony Shea, that's already been mentioned, he was, he was not the founder, but the CEO of Zappos and grew Zappos. This is actually a picture of the, the old Zappos office. Uh, this, was, this was in Henderson, which is about 30 minutes away from where the current office is. And Zappos outgrew its office and was looking for, looking for a new location for the office. Luckily, Las Vegas City Hall 
uh, became available. Uh, the city had just moved, just built a brand new city hall, which is really cool. It's actually got incredible LED lights outside of it. It changes color at night. It's very economically friendly. It um, environmentally friendly. Sorry, it's a really really cool office. But this 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 old office became available. So this actually led uh, Tony to think, well, maybe we could actually move the the Zappos office downtown. And if that happened, what what, what would then happen? He was looking at all these other companies around the world, mainly, well, sorry, in the US. Apple's office, he had a look at that. We had a look at the Nike office, had a look at the Google office. All of these, all these campuses were incredible. They had tons of really cool amenities for all the employees. But that's where it stopped. It was largely for the employees. It wasn't for the community around the office. Then got a little bit of inspiration from NYU. So the NYU campus kind of blends into the city. You can't really tell where the campus starts and the city starts and where either stops. So that led to this inspiration for what now is the downtown project. Tony went and had a look around all the, all the, well, the actual community itself around the office, what was available, what was the community like. And what he discovered was there's a really, really amazing community in this area called Fremont East. What he found was all the restaurant owners and bar owners that were in that area actually helped each other. So they didn't, they didn't see themselves as competitors. They saw themselves as really all trying to work together to try and get people to come downtown. And they were struggling. The brand of downtown Vegas wasn't, wasn't very good. He also found there were some really cool coffee shops and, again, a sense of community that happened inside of this little area. So that then led to what now is the downtown project. And the big bet that, that he had was, what would happen if we accelerated collisions, co-learning, and connectedness? So connectedness we just tried before when we did the massage. That's cool. Collisions is where you actually bump into people. So not actually literally hitting people, but actually just talking to someone, meeting someone, colliding with them. Co-learning is where you learn from others, where you actually, you know, you put on events and you learn from people, you realize that one of your peers actually learn, knows something that you don't know and you can learn from them. You bump into someone that you only thought of as the greengrocer and then you find out that he used to be a trader on Wall Street, so now you can actually learn from him. But all of that only really happens when you really, really focus on collisions, co-learning, and connectedness. So the big bet was, would focusing on collisions, co-learning, and connectedness lead to more happiness for, for humans, for the, you know, the individuals of downtown, for the, the companies and the teams of downtown, and then for downtown as a whole? Would it also lead to luckiness? And I'll talk a little bit about luck innovation and productivity. So the idea being that really by focusing on collisions, co-learning and connectedness, would that then lead to all these other ancillary benefits? And I guess that's the biggest, the big experiment that we're playing with. We've got a $350 million social experiment on the way in downtown Las Vegas, which to my knowledge is probably the largest and most audacious private investment in community that is going on in the world right now. And as Mayor Johnson said, that's just down the road. So I definitely urge any one of you in the room that would like to come for a tour and would like to walk around it, I would be very happy to take you around. The other thing that we're really focused on these is return on community, ROC, as opposed to just focusing on ROI. A lot of things can happen when you just focus on short-term return on investment. You definitely make decisions that are more focused in the short-term rather than the long-term. I mean, someone said earlier that sometimes you do things that seem crazy. Certainly, from my knowledge, I've, I've certainly found in my life that oftentimes things that in hindsight were absolute common sense in the early days seemed like insanity. And certainly a lot of what Tony's done and what the Danton Project has done, many, many people have written many articles saying it is insane. But everything, everything starts off like that. The focus that we have is a very much a long-term focus. I know for a fact that when you look at property purchases, um, if you look, take too short term a view, you might think you spent too much on a property. But I would imagine that no matter what you bought a house for in 1960, it's worth a heck of a lot more than what, it, what you bought it for today. And I think the same thing will be true in downtown Las Vegas. Even though some of the properties were purchased for a large price, if you take a long term view, um, you'll realize that it actually was, was a really cool idea. 
So instead of just focusing on short-term return on investment, we focus on ROC, which is return on community. In addition to that, we focus on return on collisions. And the collision piece for us is super important, and I know it's an issue for you as well. When you don't have enough residential density inside of a city, that you don't have the natural collisions of people. I mean, I've, I've spent a bit of time in Manhattan, and you do bump into a lot of people. There's a lot of density of people there. But certainly in downtown Las Vegas, we don't have that residential density, and it sounds like you've got some of those challenges here as well. So instead of just focusing on density and actually trying to get more people, if you actually just focused on trying to increase the number of collisions, so less people but more collisions leads to more serendipity anyway. And Tony's done a lot of work inside of Zappos on trying to increase collisions, trying to reduce the, the, the amount of doors you actually go into and out of the office. So focus on you know, collisions as opposed to just convenience. Yes, it would be more convenient to have a, a doorway straight from the car park into the office, but it would actually drive more collisions if you didn't. And instead, you made everyone walk from the, from the sorry, I'm learning American, the parking garage, not the car park, walk from the parking garage to the office by walking down a set of stairs, onto the street level, then walking into one entrance into the entire office. That would lead to more collisions. That leads to people bumping into people. That leads to a conversation that might never have happened otherwise. So definitely we're focusing on collisions as opposed to just focusing on the density of people. And then this idea of inst inst institutionalizing ROL, return on luck. And for that, what we do there is we try and accelerate serendipity. It's like I said, the collisions, um, creating a culture that's open, creating a culture where people want to talk to people, creating a culture where it's okay to give someone a massage if you want to, letting people know that oxytocin exists and giving people hugs is really, really cool. Um, just having that culture of openness and fun and happiness is, uh, is, is huge. And Zappos is really famous for its culture. And I suppose, in many ways, what we're trying to do with the downtown project is actually take what has worked really, really well inside of Zappos and that culture and actually apply it to a community rather than just inside of a company. So as you can probably tell, given that we're Vegas, we've managed to find rock and roll. So we have return on community and return on luck as our two number one metrics. So we're rocking and rolling in Vegas, which is cool. So the three ingredients of serendipity. So as I said, um, Edward Glazer wrote a really cool book called The Triumph of the City, and that's a book that everybody at the Downtown Project is, uh, is forced to read. It's a, it, but it is a tremendous book. It has some really, really amazing ideas in it. But it definitely does talk about, you know, you need that residential density of 100 people per acre. We're trying to do that with less, as I say, by focusing on the collisions. The collisions require lots and lots of street-level activity. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures and some things that we do for that. And also this culture of openness and collaboration creativity, bringing in diversity, bringing in a sense of optimism. So we really try and focus on helping the individual, the human, truly self-actualize. And then those humans tend to work in teams, and then how can we help that team self-actualize? And then those teams work together in a community, and, how, and then how can we help the community self-actualize? So university, I did a lot of study in Abraham Maslow, and I'd really love his, his, um, his theories and his hierarchy of needs. And we apply that a lot in terms of the, the stuff that we think about. So again, how can we help the, the individual? How can we help the team? And therefore, how can we help the community? And we focus on three levels. So Johnson has already told you the, the dollar figures that we have, and I'll, I'll reiterate that in a second. But where that all came from, the idea for the downtown project came from, was if we really want to focus on diversity and we really want to drive these collisions and creativeness and serendipity and having all these different people from different backgrounds collide and create some amazing, amazing things, there were seven, seven elements to that that were thought of at the start. So one of them was the Zappos employees. So Zappos was moving its head office into City Hall, old City Hall. Um, smack in the middle of, of downtown Las Vegas. So they were obviously going to be really critical. In addition to that, we really wanted some tech people, young entrepreneurs that think differently, that are creative, that are innovative, uh, that are entrepreneurial, that take risks, that don't say no, that are pioneering. We really wanted tech people. We also knew that we needed to create a sense of community through having venues, through small businesses. So our downtown had 
really no coffee shops, no restaurants, no juice bars, no yoga studios, no places where you could just hang out, no co-working spaces. So we felt that with an investment in these small businesses that we'd actually create some of that infrastructure that you definitely need for a community. In addition to that, again, another type of creative people are fashion, designers. So we really wanted to try and see if we could actually instill some sort of a fashion community. And again, on the same, same realm of, of creativity, art, music, we also wanted people that were passionate. So we, did, we didn't really put a limit on this, but if, if someone's passionate about something, let's help them. Let's invest in them. Let's try and drive that. So we really wanted all these, as you can probably tell, and then local, local residence was the, was the final piece. But just imagine if you had a room this size full of all those different types of people. So fashion people, art people, music people, tech entrepreneurs, small business owners, and you put them all together in a room and let them all talk to each other. I mean, just imagine what those conversations would be. Imagine what would come out of it. And that in many ways is, is part of what this experiment of the downtown project in Las Vegas is. is. We don't really know what the heck's gonna come out of it at the end, but we're having a lot of fun seeing what happens as we go. So the, the project itself, as we said, $350 million of one person's money. So I guess that's, where, that's what makes this kind of unique. So this is not a public venture, this is a private venture, and it's not a private with multiple people's money, it's one person's money. So we're very lucky um, that Tony's Tony, and that he has this vision, and he has this project, and he can actually make this happen. Um, we don't have outside people telling us what we should do, shouldn't do. We're able to try and figure this out for ourselves. Tony's very big on self-management, and helping people truly be empowered to truly realize their fullest potential. But the, so the project itself, so $350 million, we've already talked about that, so $50 million in small businesses, $50 million in tech startups, $50 million in education, arts, music, culture, and then $250, $200 million in real estate. So we acquired 65 acres of downtown Las Vegas, and like I said, there wasn't really much there before. Um, it was the old, part of, the old part of downtown Vegas. Vegas was hit really hard by the, uh, the financial crisis. Residential property values dropped up to 60% in some areas. Um, people just stopped going to Vegas. So Vegas really was, was, was really hit badly. So it was in many ways a good time to buy real estate. Um, so again, the, the play in the real estate will actually, I'm sure, will lead to some, lead to some fruition. But I want to take you through and give you a sense of where this money's gone, what it's done, what it's funded. And then at the end, I'll, I'll just share with you a video. So small, small businesses. $50 million put into small businesses. That's a picture from Tony's apartment. And if any of you have ever been to, 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 Ve to downtown Vegas, you can do it. You, well, you used to be able to do the downtown project tour. And you could walk through Tony's apartment. He's a very open, transparent guy. This was, this was the wall just next to his kitchen. So what he asked people to do was to write down on post-it notes what ideas they had and what they wanted to see in this community. Funnily enough, the most requested thing was daycare. But it wasn't for humans, it was for dogs. So doggy daycare was the number one requested amenity. Way, 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 way higher than uh, child daycare. So there's a dog park. <laughs> but from this $50 million, 80 plus small businesses have been funded in downtown Las Vegas. So we, you know, restaurants, coffee shops, yoga studios, um, a writer's, um, writers, it's called Writer's Block, it's a really cool bookstore where you can actually print your own books as well. But so much diversity now and bringing in really talented, passionate people into a community that weren't there before. And because they knew there was nothing there before, again, there's a sense of pioneering that they really are in the West, pioneering something that hasn't been done before. The criteria that we had for, for spending this money on the small businesses was they needed to be owner-operated, the people needed to be passionate. There had to be a link back to the community and to collisions. So there had to be a link back to how would this help drive um, collisions. We measure collisionable hours. Um, we also measure the number of collisions per square foot. So this is one of the really important metrics for us. They had to be able to execute. There needed to be an element of sustainability. Um, I mean, it's, one, it's a good thing being a billionaire, but it would be even better if you're a multi-multi-billionaire. 
but just you know, $350 million doesn't, go a, doesn't last forever. So there definitely needs to be an element of sustainability. We wanted them to be unique or first or best at something, and therefore that would drive the story worthiness. So we didn't just want downtown Vegas to be just like any other, any other city with the same stores, with the same shops, with the same chains. We wanted, really wanted this to be something that was unique for the community, so these local people doing really passionate things. So one example of that is Natalie. Natalie used to work on the Strip. We took a very old rundown building and we converted that into what has now become one of the hottest places in downtown Vegas for lunch and for breakfast. It's called Eat. We took an old check, checks cashed building. I didn't know what checks cashed was until I moved to this country. We don't have that. We don't use checkbooks anymore in Australia. I remember I went to Citibank and they said, would you like a checkbook? And I was like, no, I don't want a checkbook. And two weeks later I was back going, please give me a checkbook. <laughs> My pool guy didn't, didn't take direct deposits from my online bank. I was like, wow, this is crazy. So we took a checked cashed building, which is what it used to look like. Sarah, local community, really passionate about fashion. She really wanted to open a clothing store. So now it's a clothing store. It's also a co-working fashion space. We took a whole bunch of shipping containers. This is what the shipping containers look like. This is uh, Ern. Ern used to work at Zappos. He was really passionate about barbecue. So now, now Big Urn is called, has, um, has a barbecue store inside of our container park, which just won the prize in, in uh, I think it's Vegas, maybe Nevada, as the, uh, the number one barbecue joint. This container park is incredible. It's a retail complex, um, so it's got food, hospitality, as well as retail ventures. Built, it used to be a vacant block of land, very creative, very unique. And uh, we have live music there. We link in with the, with the local schools. So some of the local musicians that play there, every day we have live music. It's the Las Vegas Academy, puts a lot of people through to play music there. There's a giant fire-breathing praying mantis outside the front of it, which came from Burning Man, which is one of Tony's passions. There's a three-story high um, Swiss Family Robinson style play park for kids. When this first went in downtown, it was the first time I ever saw a kid in downtown Las Vegas. I mean, when I was saying kids, I'm talking like three, you know, three-year-old through to 12-year-old, so children. First time I ever saw mothers pushing strollers. So this, this truly transformed downtown Vegas. There's the fire-breathing praying mantis, which now sits, it's actually on a truck, you can drive it around, it grows. I think it's about 10 foot of flames outside of, of its antlers. What that does is it drives people down the street create some level of interest. So somebody may be in the Fremont Street experience and look down the road and see this giant praying mantis with fire coming out of its antlers and go, wow, I want to see that. So it just draws people down. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do is just get people to walk one extra block, one extra block, check it out. In addition to the small businesses, we also have the tech startups, $50 million in tech startups, over 80 investments in, in startup companies. Um, these guys have really driven, again, the, the, that entrepreneurial flair inside the city, the innovation, the creativity. Dozens of startup events. We put a lot of effort into hosting startup events for these guys, hosting conferences, making it a really cool place to hang out. We now have over 70 tech meetups that happen regularly inside the city. We're really trying to do this from the ground up and at the same time be an attractive place to bring in talent from across the country. So having a tech fund helps attract people from across the country, obviously. We've done a, some co-working spaces. This is work in progress on 6th Street. A lot of these places, these people just hang out and work there. We do community events there. We do training events. Tony took an old casino called Gold Spike, which was just full of poker machines. This is what it used to look like. This is what it looks like now. It's a co-working lounge during the day, and it's a party place at night. You can go there, free Wi-Fi, you can drink water there all day, no one will get grumpy with you if you don't buy anything. And it's just a really beautiful place where people can just hang. This is what it looks like when people are working there. In addition to that, $50 million went into education, health, arts, and fashion. We created this thing called the Learning Village, which is all these porter cabins sort of uh, created in a, in a half a block where people can actually book them and, and put on a learning event. Could be a meditation room, could be a chess club for kids, um, could be a speaker series that we have regularly where people come into the city to talk. It's just created a really nice sense of, again, learning, this passion for learning, 
Um, and it, Tony's got a really good network, and most times when one of his friends comes in, they will speak for 20, 30 minutes. These guys are great authors. These guys are CEOs of companies. Again, it's just a time for the community to come together and mingle and collide. That's what it looks like at the speaker series. Also investing in a private school. So again, if you want to try and attract residential to downtown and there's no school, that's going to be hard to attract anyone that's got children. So again, a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Does, does downtown Las Vegas need a private school? Probably not. If we put a private school in, would that help attract people to want to come and live there? Probably yes, or work there. So investment was made, private school has been, has been built. It's, it's operational, it's open. Also invested in First Friday, which is a really amazing sort of street carnival that happens on the first Friday of every month. Tracks anywhere from 20 to 40,000 people, mainly from the community. Uh, to come together and to mingle and to talk and to collide and live music, live art acts. Um, it's just a really cool place for all the schools to sort of put things on. My kids have sang in the choir there. Um, all the street performers can, can play there. And it's just a really, really nice vibe. Lots and lots and lots of street art. So this art that I'm showing you is actually on the side of a whole building. It's, it, these things are huge. It's really hard to show what they look like just by looking at, a, looking at a picture on a screen. But again, I urge you, if you get to downtown Vegas, to just have a look at the street art that's been funded. This was funded by the Life is Beautiful Festival, which I'll talk about. Life is Beautiful Festival is a... Tony decided, wouldn't it be really great to showcase what's going on downtown if we actually had um, a huge party? So once a year, Life is Beautiful Festival shuts down lots and lots and lots of blocks. It's the biggest sort of street festival that exists in the US. More blocks, more street blocks are closed for this one festival than any other festival. It's, a, it's learning, art, music, and food. So we have music festival, we have chefs, and we have amazing speakers that come and speak as well. Also funded the, uh, the Inspire Theater. Right on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Fremont Street, right next to the Fremont Street Experience, you'd think you'd probably just put a bar. Uh, Tony decided to put a, a theater there instead. Again, just to try and change this perception of what downtown Vegas is. So now we have the Inspire Theater. It can be used for speakers, um, for imprompts. We've had uh, jazz musicians playing there. We've had a movie there. Really, it's just a really nice space. We have the News Cafe where you can literally read any magazine. Also funded a progressive primary health care facility called Turntable Health. A fashion incubator called Stitch Factory, where designers can come together, they can work from in one place, they can bring an idea all the way from just conception all the way through to fruition and actually manufacture it and then distribute it. And then because of our relationship with Zappos, we can also provide a platform um, to help some of these young designers to actually sort of hit the market. So I just want to show you a four minute video and I've only got one slide after this, so this will be, this will pretty much be it for me. But just to, I kind of figured to bring this to life, a video would be really useful. So this is a video that was made by Zipcar Films, so it's, it's uh, objective. Frank Gruber, the CEO and co-founder of Tech Cocktail. This is our COO and co-founder. Jen Consalvo. Hello, everyone. Downtown Project is a project that was started by Tony Shea. Uh, the CEO of Zappos. Downtown Project already has have gone from just a handful of people to I think now over 60 employees. So they're a pretty large group uh, embarking on something that's really never been done at this scale by a private group. Tech Cocktail is a news and events organization focused on startups and entrepreneurs around the world. So we produce news stories every day, we do events all over the world. Downtown Project, it's a $350 million project. 50 of it goes to startups, so there's the Vegas Tech Fund, which is investing in, in early stage startup companies and attracting them downtown. There's also a $50 million small business fund, which basically is creating businesses, you know, restaurants and dog parks and yoga studios. And then there's also a part of it that's going into real estate, so I think it's about $200 million. So we're here at 
the Learning Village, downtown Las Vegas. And what it is is a series of different trailers that were constructed to create classroom space for educational programming. Just about every single night you can come and see a speaker or come and take a course or um, maybe there's a meetup. It was the fastest way that you could create a, a place where people could convene regularly. I'm Cyrus Radford, I'm the founder of Caputo Communities. The downtown project is an incredible experiment. Everything I've been seeing with all the new businesses and all the new life out here is, is, is really impressive. I like the whole thing that's going on here. It's really interesting, you know, everything is sort of baked in Silicon Valley. So it's nice to see a smaller community. One of the big exciting new additions to downtown Vegas is the container park. I think it has roughly 40 small businesses in it, so the actual shipping containers create the park itself, and they're filled with bars and restaurants and boutiques and even a barber shop. There's a stage where they have lots of music acts. One of the most interesting parts of it is a sort of Swiss Family Robinson style giant tree house in the middle where kids can just play all day long, so it's a really great community space. Work in Progress is a co-working space. It's a place where you know companies work out they can actually get their own dedicated space or they can just be a community member and come when they like. They're continually doing different types of classes and different types of mentoring programs. Um, so it's become a hub for startups. One of the most unique spaces here in downtown Vegas is called the Stitch Factory. We are a fashion incubator. We support uh, and curate local and emerging designers. We have a design studio space where they can come and co-work out of and have access to um, our cutting tables, our dress forms, and industrial machines. So it's very educational, but it's also very functional. So people can actually go there and build things for their fashion startup. It's a great space. They've thrown a few good parties there. And I actually had my wedding dress created there. They did it from design through implementation. It's a really neat space. In addition to the startups, the most amazing thing is there's physical change every day. And in the past year, it has just grown at such an incredible pace. It used to be like you'd stay in this one or two block radius, and now that radius is like six blocks or eight blocks. It's continuing to grow outside of that, so every few months gets pushed out a little bit more. All these things keep you excited because startups, they're invisible. They can work from anywhere. They're not like brick and mortar. So having this physical change helps, I think, to keep an excitement in the air. To be able to plug into something like that that's got different stakeholders from the community, um, including Downtown Project, has helped us have that voice and also a place to listen and hear what's going on around the rest of the community. One of my favorite little mottos that's popped up around town is downtown makes you smarter. That's kind of part of the ethos of downtown Vegas. Any given night of the week, anything from music to a speaker series to a trivia night, the things that you might expect going on across a huge city are all happening right here within the footprint. So if that gives you a flavor. Last thing I just wanted to talk to you about was the role of Rocketeer. So I also work with uh, Rocketeer. Um, you can probably tell it's called Rocketeer because of our return on community is one of our key focuses. Rocketeer is a team, a full-time team of four people, all with incredible experience in terms of history, 20 years plus experience in a, in a various field. We have one of the founding employees of Evernote um, who helped build Evernote from 10,000 users to 110 million users. Um, she's our tech person on the team. We have Kimberly who's had 20 years plus experience in PR and branding and marketing. We also have a, a Danielle, who's a CFO. She's been a COO and a CFO of media companies. I'm also on the team. I've had an interesting background in, I was 10 years with PwC in professional services and management consulting. Then I've, been this, I've worked for Australia's largest retailer in a senior executive position. Then I was CEO of a restaurant chain. And then I did my own tech startup. So we've, we've all got really, really cool experiences. What we do for the community is we're funded by the community. So the community themselves don't actually pay for our services, the community owner pays for our services, which means that we can actually off offer help to anyone in the community. And this is help that they wouldn't necessarily be able to afford. So we can actually work with, you know, grassroots, one of our juice bar. There's no way they could afford to pay, you know, three, four hundred dollars an hour for someone to really truly help them to get to that next level. But because the community is funding us, we can actually just give them that help. So we focus on the three levels, which I talked about before. So the human level, helping the humans in the community be the best that they can be. We've all been coached. We've all been, sorry, we've all been trained in coaching. We have a relationship with, with the Tony Robbins organization. So we all, we all help them as, at an individual level. We also work with them at a team level. So we help their company, their team, their, their, their company to sort of achieve all that they can achieve. And then what we also do at the community level is help the community connect. So we also drive those collisions, the connectedness. 
Um, so we're in some ways a bit of the glue holding this community and trying to self-actualize this, uh, this community as best we can. So I'll just leave you with this. In the last few years, we've reached the tipping point. 50% uh, of humans on planet Earth live in cities. That had never been reached before. The anticipation is that within our lifetime, in this room, 75% of humans will live in cities, which is staggering when you think about it. Again, never happened before. So certainly what we're focused on in the downtown project in Las Vegas, and I know the downtown partnership in Sacramento is also focused on, is if 75% of all humans are actually gonna end up living in cities, then we might as well make them a place of community, of creativity, and of connectedness. That would definitely be a much nicer, funner, happier uh, place to live if we did that, and we can do that. And with that, I'll leave you. Thank you.